John William Cooper was born in Milford Haven, Wales. He was one of seven children. His father worked as an agricultural labourer, and soon John Cooper himself would work the fields as a local farmhand. He was part of the post-war baby boom generation. He left school at 15, he got involved in a range of different trades, which wasn't anything particularly unusual. So he appeared to have a fairly regular upbringing. There aren't any really obvious signs of the trauma, the abuse or the neglect that we see in cases of serial killers. He left home at 15. One of the reasons why he was able to leave is because he was a fairly talented guy around the farm, around in, in a rural environment. He could do a lot of things so he, he could get by. And he was a very independent person. Most children wouldn't leave then because they'd be afraid to. He wasn't afraid because he was a man, he could take care of himself. He was quite well known in the local farming community, you know, making his way in the world. Soon, the wayward Cooper settled down to family life. He married his childhood sweetheart at the age of 21, and before long, they welcomed a son and a daughter into the world. From the outside, Cooper did appear to be a regular family guy. They had two children, so looking in, they looked to be the ideal nuclear family. Cooper presented quite a respectable veneer to the outside world. But the married man Cooper liked to indulge outside of the family home. He did quite enjoy the high life. He liked going out and drinking and gambling. And he was gregarious. The people that knew him socially thought he was a stand-up guy. But actually, he had a very short fuse. He would lose his temper very easily. So here's somebody who's crafting this performance of self, which isn't the real him. He was quite well known in the local community, quite well liked, known to have a violent temper, but nevertheless, you know, one of the boys, so to speak, in the local pub. In 1978, at the age of 34, Cooper found work with the multi-million dollar oil giant Gulf, working as a welder's mate at the local refinery. That same year, Cooper himself struck it rich, winning a newspaper competition, spot the ball. He won £90,000, a fortune. In today's terms, it would probably half a million pounds, as well as a £4,000 Austin princess. If he had been a more temperate man, he would probably have saved some of that money. But after giving £1,000 each to 10 of his family members, the generosity seemed to stop there. Cooper, the gambler, started burning a hole through his lucky winnings. This is a life-changing amount of money. But he didn't hold on to it for very long. I think because he did live that fast and high lifestyle, he continued to gamble, he continued to drink, he invested in, in fairly misplaced business ventures. So he was soon parted from that money. But once that money was gone, it didn't get rid of that sense of entitlement, that sense in which I want to have these things that I was able to buy before. There's a hypomanic quality to it. He looks to me like he probably was what some people call a cyclothymic personality or manic depressive illness. And in his moments of euphoria, he gambles, he thinks he can do anything, and all of a sudden he looks down and his money's gone. The seemingly happy-go-lucky John Cooper was in fact deeply troubled beneath the surface. His teenage son particularly bore the brunt of Cooper's rage. Not only was he subjected to beatings, at one stage he even claimed his father placed a shotgun into his mouth and threatened to kill him. He contrived to be a violent and aggressive man. It drove the son out of the house. He couldn't bear his father. Despite his son escaping the home at just 16, Cooper had to keep up the appearance of a happy family, enjoying their newfound wealth that he'd secretly squandered. With no sign of getting caught during his two-year crime spree around rural Pembrokeshire, Cooper thought he was on a winning streak. On the night of the 22nd of December 1985, he racked the stakes up even higher. His next target was barely a mile from his own doorstep, Scoverston Manor in Stainton. 
Now, they are local farmers, they're quite wealthy, and Cooper is known to them, so this is quite a, a close-knit community. They're a rich and reclusive pair called Richard and Helen Thomas. They lived in a three-storey farmhouse uh, set in considerable acres, not more than a mile from where Cooper actually lived. Cooper got there thinking that Helen would be on her own, burst in, threatened her with the shotgun. But unbeknownst to Cooper, Helen's brother, Richard, was close by. Unexpectedly, Richard returned, almost without thinking. Cooper turns his shotgun on Richard and kills him. He ties up Helen and shoots her in the face, killing her. The siblings were both shot at close range in the head, but brother Richard was also wounded in the stomach. A close range discharge with a shotgun will almost completely destroy the head. If Richard was shot in the stomach first, he'd be well aware of what had happened to him. For Richard, we can only hope that the shot to the head was first and that he was dead from that. I strongly suspect that the first shot was the one to the abdomen. When it didn't kill him, then there's the fatal shot to the head. The whole situation must have been utterly terrifying. It was a dastardly, brutal crime in pursuit, of course, of Cooper's lifestyle. But he then sets fire to the house in an effort to conceal the crime. So not only has he invaded their privacy and their space, not only has he taken their things, not only has he taken their lives, he's decided that he's going to burn the place to the ground. Cooper committed these crimes in his own backyard. And I think this, this high risk offending, he didn't really care, I think, or, or didn't really think very much far ahead. He would see an opportunity and he would take it. He would live very much in the present moment, not really giving very much thought to what was going to happen afterwards. Police had heard about Cooper's fondness for the limelight, and in February 2009, a copy of the episode that he appeared on was traced back to ITV's archive in Leeds. They compared it to a sketch of a suspect seen using Peter Dixon's bank card, wearing similar shorts to the ones found in Cooper's home. When they looked at the video and then compared that video to the artist's impression of the man who might have attacked the Dixons, the two were almost identical. I think the superintendent said it was as if you could trace one over the other. It was almost a perfect match. So now we begin to have the net closing around Cooper. Now Cooper was back out on the streets, having served 10 years of his 16-year sentence for armed robbery and burglary. But time was running out for the killer. More and more details being heaped on top of what the police are coming to believe is an absolutely airtight case against Cooper. In May, barely months after he's got out of jail, Cooper is re-arrested. The police even filmed the moment they pounced on Cooper as he went to collect his morning paper, satisfied they'd put this dangerous killer back in prison. He continues to deny everything. But the forensic evidence is beginning to become overwhelming. During questioning, Cooper admitted owning the shorts that had the key evidence against him, Peter Dixon's blood. Further forensic tests on the clothing had thrown up something even more interesting. The hem had actually been taken up, so they took the hem down and they found another piece of DNA evidence. Now, this DNA belonged to the daughter of Peter and Gwenda Dixon, so this proved fairly conclusively that these shorts belonged to Peter Dixon. Police believe these were stolen from Peter's rucksack just before Cooper fled the murder scene. Cooper was finally brought to Swansea Crown Court on the 22nd of March 2011 to face justice as well as the expert witnesses lined up to prove the case against him, 
His own son also took to the stand, unmasking the dark, violent side of the lovable rogue. He revealed his habitual nighttime walks, stalking the local Pembrokeshire countryside, armed and dangerous. He denied everything. Not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And for weeks, sustained precisely that stance. But that did not convince the jury. The forensic evidence proved decisive, as did the bullseye videotape. When Cooper returned for sentencing on the 26th of May, he continued to protest his innocence. You must judge me after the trial, not before. Judge John Griffith Williams gave him four life sentences and told him the murders were of such evil wickedness that the mandatory sentence of life will mean just that. For Angela Gallup and her team, it had been a triumph for their painstaking forensics work. It was a really satisfying case. I think he's an extremely dangerous man. I think he's just one of the most dangerous criminals that I've come across in my time in uh, doing forensic science. Huntley was born in Grimsby in Lincolnshire on the 31st of January, 1974. He had a turbulent time at school and was often the target of bullying. So I think this created a, a bit of a sense of shame in Ian Huntley, something that is often at the root of a lot of men like him in terms of what they go on to do. So he started off as, as somebody who was always the kid that was a bit odd, the, the odd one out, the, the one who's a bit of a loner. In December 1994, Huntley met 18-year-old Claire Evans. They had a whirlwind romance and were married within weeks. His wife, Claire, quickly found that he had a terrible temper. She later claimed that uh, she feared for her life and that he would often put his hands round her neck. Ian Huntley is somebody who is not capable of having a normal relationship with a woman. So he, he moves very quickly because he wants to maintain a sense of control within his relationships. So he will breeze into women's lives, this knight in shining armor full of, of charm and compliments and, and will kind of try and wind them in. Huntley's marriage didn't last long. His wife, Claire, had started a relationship with his younger brother, Wayne. Despite the marriage being all but over, Huntley refused to grant her a divorce until 1999 to prevent their relationship from becoming official. He'd always felt incredibly threatened by his younger brother. He took the attention away from him when he, he came into that family. And because of Ian Huntley's narcissistic tendencies, he's always going to feel he's being outdone by, by his brother. While still married to Claire, Huntley fathered a daughter with a 15-year-old girl in 1998. I think it will be fair to say that Huntley demonstrated throughout his adolescence and early manhood that he had an unhealthy appetite in younger and younger women. Well, during his 20s, Ian Huntley preyed on a lot of young girls, underage girls, and, and the police who investigated the case thought that there were possibly up to 60 young girls that he'd had some kind of interaction with on, on that level and he would kind of worm his way into to these girls' lives. And they're younger, they're, they're more impressionable, they're easier to, to lure in. In 1998, 24-year-old Huntley appeared at Grimsby Crown Court, charged with both burglary and the rape of an 18-year-old girl. Both cases were dropped due to lack of evidence, but he was gaining a bad reputation across Lincolnshire. He was an uh, insignificant little man who, uh, on the surface, wouldn't say boo to a goose. Unfortunately, he had no conscience and would do whatever he wanted when he wanted to do it. In February 1999, Huntley met 22-year-old Maxine Carr, and after dating for just four weeks, they moved in together. She was naive, impressionable, and he was a uh, an interesting figure to her, I think. She found him perhaps, I would hesitate to call him charismatic, but at least interesting, and did not 
discover the violent side to his nature that his wife had. Maxine Carr was a very easy target, in a way, for Ian Huntley, because um, at this point in his life, um, he's managed to hone those skills of hooking women in, being quite superficially charming and manipulative and saying the things that they wanted to hear. So he's got quite a well-rehearsed script at this point in time. On the 15th of August, 11 days after the girls went missing, Sky News decided to retrace their steps, which meant interviewing the last person to see them, local school caretaker Ian Huntley, the boyfriend of Holly and Jessica's classroom assistant, Maxine Carr. It's 6.15 p.m. The timeline on that Sunday night, the 4th of August, puts the girls here, right in the forecourt of the village college, the local education centre. We know they'd been to the sports centre just across the road a few minutes before to buy some sweets and were carrying on walking through what would have been very familiar territory. Their primary school, St Andrews, is just across the back of the village college here. How do we know they were here at 6.15? Well, we have an eyewitness. Ian Huntley here is a familiar figure. Evening, Ian. You're the school caretaker. The girls, Jessica and Holly, would know you, and they saw you on the front doorstep. What, what went on? The girl, I don't know the girls. Um, I stood on the front doorstep, grooming my dog down. She'd run away and come back a bit of a mess. Um, they just came across and asked how Miss Carr was, as she used to teach them at St Andrews. Um, I just said she weren't very good, as she hadn't got the job. And they just says, please tell her that we're very sorry and uh, off the walk in the direction of the, um, the library over there. And you may, as it turned out, have been the last person to actually chat to them before they vanished. Yeah, that's what it seems like. Huntley looked like an unassuming, ordinary little bloke with a soft voice who wouldn't hurt a fly. He was a slight withdrawn sort of character, but at the time he seemed reasonably credible. It seemed like a credible story. That's where the girls would have walked. So when I talked to him, I had an open mind. I certainly, at the time, wasn't thinking, this is the guy that's done them harm. Maxine Carr was also keen to appear on camera. We interviewed her in the middle of the village and got her to tell us about her relationship with the girls. They're ever so funny, they're brilliant, they're kind to everybody. Um, they wouldn't say a bad word about anybody. And they love their families and everything, which is why nobody believes that they would ever run away. Um, that was very close to all their family. This is something I'll probably keep for the rest of my life, I think. It's what Holly gave me on the last day of term. She was very upset, and that's the kind of girl she was. She was just lovely, really lovely. In the conversation, we realised a few minutes afterwards, she spoke about the girls in the past tense. When I was talking to her live, didn't really occurred to me, but a couple of minutes afterwards we said thanks very much and she walked off and uh, my producer said, just play that tape again, I'm sure she was talking about the girls in the past tense. Often the perpetrator is among the searchers, not without exception, but often, because they want to admire their own handiwork. Could it be the person responsible for Holly and Jessica's disappearance had been under the noses of detectives from day one? On the 16th of August 2002, 12 days after the disappearance of 10-year-old schoolgirls Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, local caretaker Ian Huntley and his girlfriend Maxine Carr had been taken in for questioning by police. Interviews given by the pair on Sky News had roused the suspicions of detectives. We were starting to think, wow, these two people really could be involved in something to do with these girls. They're close enough to it. They've clearly aroused police suspicion at this stage. But after just seven hours, they were released when Carr provided Huntley with an alibi. She claimed she was with him in their home on the night of the girl's disappearance. It wasn't until about 10 or 11 at night that we heard that police released them, which we found interesting. And I got a phone number from Maxine Carr. If I thought, well, worth a gamble, I'll just ring and see if I get through to them. And extraordinarily enough, I did. I got straight through to Maxine Carr. And I said, I gather you've been interviewed by the police. What happened? How are you? She said, well, we're fine. 
Um, I can't tell you anything about it, but it's all all right. Huntley then grabbed the phone off her and I guess wanted to end the conversation quickly. So he said, well, thanks for ringing. Uh, yeah, we're fine, nothing, nothing to report. Um, the police have let us go, nothing going on. Thanks a lot, thanks for ringing, bye. Once Huntley and Carr had been questioned, further searches were carried out at their home and at Huntley's place of work, Soham Village College. It was quite clear as we checked back that something had happened on the Friday night during the interviews with Huntley and Carr. It had triggered further searches, and because they suddenly saw Huntley as perhaps the key figure here, they went back over his territory, his home, and his workplace. And it was then that they began to find evidence that he had abducted the girls. On the 17th of August, investigators got their biggest breakthrough in the case yet. In the bins at the school where Huntley worked, they found the burnt remains of two football shirts, tracksuit bottoms, shoes and some underwear. Forensic expert Peter Lamb identified the clothes as those belonging to Holly and Jessica. One of the crucial items in this particular case was the tops that the little girls were last seen in. These were unusual, and this helped us tremendously to build up a picture of the types of fibres that it would be easy for us to find. Whenever two human beings interact, there is an exchange of material, be that something as tiny as DNA up to something less subtle like a, a fibre, up to saliva or bodily fluids, blood we leave a mark on each other. And no matter how hard one tries to destroy all of that evidence, there will usually be something left to say that two people have been interacting. There is this constant interaction of material that allows forensic scientists to draw conclusions and ultimately to come up with very strong evidence that places one person in one place with another person and builds the case. Forensic scientist Peter Lamb had the girls' clothes, but now he had to link them forensically to Ian Huntley. And it didn't take long. During the examination of the items from the bin, um, I found five human head hairs. These head hairs were compared with Holly's hair and Jessica's hair. They didn't match either of those two but they did match Ian Huntley's hair. This vital evidence led to the arrest of both Ian Huntley and Maxine Carr on the very same day, the 17th of August, on suspicion of abduction and murder. Sinclair was born in Glasgow in the post-war years, and, and this was a time of real change and real upheaval for the city. There was a lot of poverty, and there was quite a significant gang culture, so violence was part and parcel of everyday life for many young men. Angus had two older siblings, a brother and a sister, but this didn't stop him from being picked on. He was the runt of the litter, but he was also small. By the time he'd reached puberty, he was constantly being bullied, knocked about, thrown about. Tragically, Sinclair's father died when he was just four years old. I think that certainly increased his feeling of depression, of being an outsider, of not being like everybody else. And he chose to identify with petty theft and petty crime as his revolt against the world. In 1959, when Sinclair was just a young teen, he committed his first offence. He was only 13 when he stole the offertory box at the local church, and that uh, led to him uh, having a criminal conviction. At the same time, he became preoccupied with sex. Now, the early sexualisation of young men is a clue to problems later on. And we start to see this pattern in Angus Sinclair. By the age of 15, Sinclair's bad behaviour escalated and became increasingly violent. He viciously attacked an eight-year-old girl. If there was a trigger to the career that he then 
went on to found as a rapist and a murderer, 1961 was probably the moment in which it started, because later in the year, he committed the first serious attack on a neighbour, young girl, uh, near, lived nearby. On July the 1st, Sinclair was home alone when he decided to strike again. This time, the victim was a child who lived in a neighbouring flat in the tenement block, seven-year-old Catherine. He's 16 at the time, and th there's, there's quite a lot of respect amongst children for older children. So he asks her to run an errand for him, and, and she goes out and she does it. Now, when she comes back, he attacks her. Sinclair took the girl up to his flat, where he viciously assaulted her. Then, in the middle of his heinous act, he suddenly stopped. There's a knock at the door, and he just literally stops what he's doing and goes and answers the door and sends the neighbour away. Sinclair got rid of the visitor and went back to attacking the girl. He raped her, he killed her, using a ligature from a bicycle in a bicycle tube. It's a vicious, premeditated, calculating, callous attack on an utterly innocent young girl. The callous killer quickly came up with a plan to dispose of the child's body. I think most 16-year-olds would panic, but what he did was he sorted out her lower clothing to try to hide the fact that it had been a sexual attack. He rolled her body down the stairs and he, he left it there to be found, obviously hoping that it would look as though she had fallen downstairs and, and, and injured herself. Left at the bottom of the communal staircase inside the tenement block, Catherine was quickly found by neighbours. By the following day, she was confirmed dead. Forensic testing was still in its infancy at the time, but with such key evidence, scientists hoped their analysis could help pinpoint the killer. Now, blood grouping on these materials should be fairly straightforward when it's that fresh, but it actually proved quite difficult to get good, clear results on, so we had to kind of abandon those results. We weren't able to get terribly clear results on that. Scientists at the time could not help the police find the culprits, now branded the world's end killers by the press. Lester Nib and the team at the lab held on to the samples in the hope that future advancements in forensic technology would later solve the case. Relatively early in 1978, the police kind of drew a close. We produced a report, an interim report, to keep the police up to date with what we'd found. And effectively, all the, the exhibits were taken away for storage by the police. But just over a year after the World's End murders, Sinclair struck again. On November the 19th, 1978, he was prowling near Barnhill Station in the suburbs of Glasgow. There he spotted a target, a petite 17-year-old machinist called Mary Gallagher. Mary Gallagher was in her late teens, but the significant thing about Mary is that she was tiny. She looked like a child. Mary Gallagher was going to meet her friend over the other side of the railway tracks, and her mother saw her set out, her, her sister saw her set out as well. Mary was last seen leaving her home at 6.45 p.m. Sinclair threatened Mary with a knife. He demanded that she took her clothes off, and he slit her throat with a knife. This was a really, really nasty attack. It would take more than 20 years to prove that Sinclair was Mary's killer. Meanwhile, he continued to commit a catalogue of cruel offences. One of the extraordinary things about Sinclair was known to the police. He had a reputation as a mugger. At one point, he got a handgun conviction. They knew he was a violent man, but they didn't connect the dots. Sinclair was a man who got away with it for a very long time. Between 1978 and 1982, a total of 11 children reported being sexually assaulted by Sinclair. Over a number of years, we think exclusively targeted children because there aren't any unsolved rapes or rapes and murders of that time from about 1978 to 1982 that match his MO. Sinclair would ask them to run an errand for him, and then when they returned, he would attack them. Sinclair used his job as a painter and decorator as cover for his despicable deeds. In 1982, Sinclair was finally caught out. 
In June, Sinclair was in the Woodlands area of Glasgow where he assaulted a six-year-old girl. But this time, the alert child was able to identify her attacker. One girl, six-year-old girl, who he carried out a really serious sexual assault on, recognised the smell of turpentine on him. He was dressed as a painter and flecks of paint were on his hair and shoes. Sinclair, now aged 37, was arrested and subsequently stood trial at Edinburgh's High Court. On August the 31st, 1982, he was convicted of three charges of rape, seven charges of lewd and libidinous practices and a breach of the peace. The Crown decided to take a very, very simple approach to the case. They decided not to bother with all the supporting evidence, the hairs and fivers, the knots, nothing like that. They decided just to go on the simple, straightforward DNA. Here is a girl that's been murdered. Here is her coat. On that coat is DNA, and the DNA belongs to Angus Sinclair. End of story. Sinclair and his lawyers saw a chance to deny the murder. Eventually, in 2004, the DNA evidence points conclusively to Sinclair as part of the world's end killings. Sinclair stands trial, but comes up with what to him, I'm sure, seemed a perfect defence. Oh, yes, I am. Oh, well, I mean, this DNA proves I had sex with uh, Christine and Helen after the world's end. But of course, it was entirely consensual. And when I left them with my brother-in-law, Gordon, uh, they were alive and well and as far as I was aware, in fine spirits. It was all Gordon's fault. That was his defence. Sinclair's testimony was enough to prove reasonable doubt. The judge decided that because of the suggestion of consensual sex, then that the whole of the DNA evidence which was being put forward by the Crown was no longer relevant. None of the supporting evidence had been included by the Crown, and therefore the case fell in 2007. Without any other forensic evidence, Judge Lord Clark threw the case out. It was one of the worst days of my life. I mean, I, I can remember it distinctly yet. Yeah, it was just this sense of total disbelief. The families of Helen and Christine had been waiting 30 years for justice. Helen Scott's father was there that day. Absolutely shattered. Uh, what's going to explain how I feel? 30 years of trying to get a conclusion. The decision also sent shockwaves across Scotland. When the trial collapsed, a lot of journalists, politicians, and significantly the Lord Advocate themselves, who's in charge of all prosecutions in Scotland, said, whoa, stop, something about this isn't right. And that started a pretty root and branch review of the justice system, particularly when it comes to double jeopardy. Scotland was one of the last countries in Western Europe to have a law that stated you could not be tried for the same crime twice. It was overhauled in the wake of the 2007 trial. So the law changed, and then Angus Sinclair was the first person to be retried under the double jeopardy legislation. When the go-ahead for the second trial was given, I came out of the court and I, I phoned my dad straight away to tell him. It wasn't about celebrating. None of this has ever been about celebrating. But what it did do was just give that opportunity to bring this chapter to an end. On the 13th of October 2014, 69-year-old Angus Sinclair stood trial again for the murders of two 17-year-old friends, Helen Scott and Christine Eady. This time, the Crown prosecutors used all the latest forensic technology to make their case. The trial lasted weeks, attended every day, and this time, the Crown got it absolutely right. I mean, that was compelling evidence from knots to soil samples to DNA to just a whole picture was put together. Exactly what should have happened in 2007 and didn't. And the jury convicted him unanimously. There was no question whatsoever.